fire at a nightclub in Come Rhode on. Island. Where's the line that they inevitably cross that alienate their true fans? Fuck it, we're gonna try to do Pantera as well. I can't stand it. That album to me, I can't stand it. But I think Cherry Pie just was one more log on the fire. They got a hit with Pour Some Sugar on You. And everyone, including the devil, bought this album. Say, hey, it's not that fucking bad. It's that fucking no, bad. They should have either broken up or completely gone in a different direction. I remember thinking, hey, I, I kind of like this song, but I also remember thinking, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, they seem like the perfect ballad band. For the record, I did like a couple songs on the first Nelson album, but don't tell anybody. That get up kind of says it all. They were confused as shit. What the fuck? did you guys just do to your legacy? Gary Sharon doing Van Halen 3. Say, Dad, listen to this Kanye song, and I'm like, where did I go wrong? Look, I came here to do two things, chew bubble gum and talk hair metal, and it looks like I'm almost out of bubble gum. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Hair Metal Guru. My name is Anthony, and they call me the Guru, and today we have a really cool episode where we are going to be talking about uh mistakes that hair metal bands have made and joining me today is a person that i've never met before his name is ryan but i've i've listened to, to tons of his commentary that he has done a, a lot of videos with metal mike so I, I love hearing your take on on these bands and you have a lot of interesting observations so ryan welcome to the show oh thanks man great to be here i really appreciate it and this is like my moment of zen every time this kind of thing comes up. I guess a little about me. I just, uh, I got into this when I was a, a very young man. Uh, older siblings are to uh, credit for that one. And a, a really cool father who's happens to be 75, but is uh, a partner in my ACDC love. He took me to my right. first concert in 96. Okay. Um, I'm going to be 43 this year. So awesome. I, I I did miss the uh, the heyday living it, but man, it, it's yeah. okay because uh, I, I got to to grow up with all this stuff, and I this kind of music been in my life um, forever. So yeah, you know, it's it's pumped into my veins. Hey man, that's 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 awesome to hear. So you know, uh, I have a, my son is seventeen, and so he he grew up going to school in ACDC and Kiss shirts, and. <laughs> um, He's he's now starting to stray away from hair metal land, wow. and he's starting to listen to a lot of Kanye West. So oh, come on, I, no? yeah, <laughs> so his his mom and I are not together. So he lives with his mom. He's here about half time, but he'll text me and say, "Dad, listen to this Kanye song." And I'm like, "Where did I go wrong?" Oh so, man. Anyway, it's anyway, okay. it's it's uh, awesome to have you on the show, and and I'm super excited about this topic. Yeah, because, you know we we I. I've already had a couple episodes recently about hair metal flops, you know, the, the albums that for one reason or another didn't do what they were supposed to do. So that led me to thinking like, what, you know, what are the decisions that happen to bands that m might either lead to a flop might lead to problems within the band. So you and I were talking about, you know, getting together for an episode. And I thought, you know what, hair metal mistakes, what are the, ba what are the mistakes that bands have made? That impacted, you know, maybe an album, maybe their entire career. So that's right. what we're talking about today is hair metal mistakes and uh, super pumped to have you on to share because we're each going to share 10, 10 different examples. So without further ado, yeah. Ryan, what, what's the what's the first hair metal mistake that, that you got that impacted a band? Well, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. So my first hair metal mistake and I didn't want to cross this over into the flops because I noticed that a lot of your flops were albums that you really enjoy oh, yeah. just they didn't do very well for one reason or another yeah. so this happens to kind of fit both categories I don't know if it was necessarily a flop but I have Hurricane putting out Over the Edge in 88 okay so Hurricane I love I love Hurricane they're one of those bands that can do no wrong in my eyes except this album. They just didn't really do it for me. And 88 was a prime, prime time for a band like Hurricane. They had the look, the momentum, the big time connections with Sarzo and Cavazzo. And to me, they delivered one song on Over the Edge and it was I'm On To You. I love that song. I could sing it all the time. It's great. It's killer. It rips. I love when it comes on the radio or XM, whatever. 
it was what people were looking for. I'd say a close second was maybe shout and we are strong, but it's just, they're almost there. The song give me an inch has such a killer chorus. I love that chorus, but the song's weird. The rest of it's just weird. I mean, the the chorus makes it killer, but that's about it. So I love take what you want. I absolutely love slave to thrill. That album is pure, solid, undeniable hard rock. And I even prefer Liquid Fury over, over the Edge. That album I like a lot. That was featured in one of uh, the 80s Glam Metal Cast episodes. And, and Metal Mike was like, dude, you're talking about Liquid Fury? Like, who talks about this album? And I'm like, I do, because it's killer and give it a shot. So these, had, these guys had everything to be huge. And I feel like this album kind of halted their momentum. Okay. Okay. Y- you know what? It wasn't even like, I remember hearing, uh, what was the, I'm on to you Yeah, back in the day and thinking yeah. that's a pretty good song, but for some yeah. reason, I, you know, I never went out and bought hurricane albums I say and, that. and outside of that song, I bet until two years ago, I couldn't have named you another song. Yeah. Then somebody on X or what, you know, I, I hear about so many bands from this group, this group of, of, of guys that that are are on X and are all into this music, including Metal Mike. But somebody was talking about Slave to the Thrill. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I'll go check it out, you know, kind of begrudgingly because I just didn't remember. So anyway, I love that album. Um, uh, y- you don't hear, I don't hear a lot of people talking about Hurricane and so the the fact that that you're going to label that that album a mistake is interesting so yeah because the first one take what you want is strip metal it's killer there's there's just ripping songs on there obviously i talked about over the edge and then slave has like just straight up hard rock like next to you rain of love Ten Thousand years smiles like a child like dude come on those those are killer and kelly hansen's got one of those silky smooth voices and when he randomly turns on the little bit of rasp you're like oh that's good and doug aldrich was the missing ingredient i believe and over the edge he came in on slave to thrill and and that's a that's a really good one awesome. <laughs> all right so so my first my number 10 is uh a band that man i i've just I, gr- I gravitated to this band from the first time I read about them in a magazine. The, the band is is tough. And they put out, you know, their debut album, uh, What Comes Around Goes Around, uh, in 1991. And I just, I remember reading, it was in like a metal edge, and Stevie Rochelle, they would do these, you know, talk about every song on your album. And I remember him talking about the song, I Hate Kissing You Goodbye. Mm-hmm. And said, And he said, if you crossed uh, Motley Crue's Home Sweet Home and Bon Jovi's Wanted Dead or Alive, you would have I Hate Kissing You Goodbye. And I thought, well, shit, I love both of those songs. So yeah. buy this on cassette tape and 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 fall in love with it. But, you know, the band never made it. it right. Made. No. Um, I Hate Kissing You Goodbye was released as a single. And, you know, m- most people, if you follow Metal Sludge or Stevie Rochelle, you've heard it got up to number three on the <laughs> uh, Dial MTV. And that's pretty good. And it was held, you know, this is right when the Metallica Black album is out, the Nirvana debut album is out. And I, like I said, I love the song I Hate Kissing You Goodbye. But for a hard rock band to release a ballad as a first single, I think that turns a lot, you know, it turns the rockers off. It almost turned me off. I had the cassette before I ever heard that song on the radio. Yeah. So there's a, there's a song on that album called the all new generation. Oh yeah. And, and in that song, Stevie Rochelle is singing about the history of music all the way from Elvis to the Beatles, to Aerosmith and Alice Cooper, to Bon Jovi, Poison and Skid Row. And it's it's utterly catchy. And why they didn't release that as a single, and you could have had an epic music video, yeah. Uh, and follow it up with "I Hate Kissing You Goodbye." I thought it was a huge mistake. Now, I'll say this: that that in 1991, most new hair metal bands were going to struggle. I mean, it was getting to the point where it, it was almost too late. 
you know, you still had some bands that were that were going platinum that year. Um, yeah. But Tough was not one of them. And and I think releasing a ballad as a single hurt their chances to make it to the top. Well, dude, they didn't follow the recipe. They didn't follow right. the, you know, the, let's just use White Snake. The Here I Go Again, Still the Night, maybe those are vice versa, and, and then your ballad. That was the recipe. You know what I mean? It, and, it, and it worked so well. I don't understand. And I've seen Stevie Rochelle talk about this countless times. And he, it's a major regret by him. I'll tell you what. It looked like a bigger budget video. He looked killer. The band looked killer. Yep. But, dude, you're not going to – it just wasn't going to work that way. And, and I don't understand who talked him into it. I don't, I don't know that part of it. But – but with the all new generation thing, as well as the good guys wear black thing, like they're, they're, uh, this album's freaking killer, dude. Like this, this album has so many, you could have chosen three or four other ones to put out as your first single and then deliver the ballad, even if it was one rocker, then a ballad, which was probably more apropos for the time. Yeah. And, and, the, and there were, a, there was a couple other, all this couple other great ballads on there, Wake Me Up. And yes, a song called "So Many Seasons" that that was kind of mid tempo, but yeah. good guys wear black. You're absolutely right. You know, man. If if the and I say this all the time. Metal Mike says it all the time. Probably everybody who likes hair metal says it all the time. If it came out in '89, it probably blows up. It comes out in '91, and and it it sinks without a trace. Exactly. But, you know. Hey, and Stevie Rochelle's been really cool to me. He's, he's shared some of my stuff wow. on Metal Sludge. So I will throw out that he has uh, what comes around goes around has been remastered and re released on on vinyl and oh, yeah. released on CD. The remastered I have the vinyl and and it's phenomenal. So so go to Metal Sludge uh, if you're into that album. Get the remastered version. It's fantastic. Absolutely love that album. All right. Okay. What's your what's your number nine? All right. Cool. So this one. This was the production on ACDC Flick of the Switch. Okay, I shall start by saying that ACDC is my number one forever and always band. I, I <laughs> they're, they're my guys, okay? Yeah. That, that's what got me into it. When I talked about my dad, you know, he had, if you want blood, highway to hell and back in black. And that was pretty killer for like a dude in his 30s and the later 70s to, to make that happen. And I remember just staring at highway to hell when I was like, just tripping out of what what is this dude on the cover with the tail and the horns and all this shit anyway acdc has been in my blood for a long time i'll never stop loving them i listen to him probably every day so anyway <laughs> that being said <laughs> um i know you know every song every note everything from high voltage up through stiff upper lip but then post stiff upper lip that's another story i kind of yeah. i kind of stray away a little bit but anyway Flick of the Switch is an absolute scorcher for me, and I crank the shit out of it all the time. Songs like Nervous Shakedown, Bedlam in Belgium, Flick of the Switch, Guns for Hire, all are killer. But even I can admit when a band that doesn't make very many mistakes made it somewhat of a mistake, okay? So the prior three were Mutt Lang albums, yeah. and they sounded like hard rock butter. You know what I mean? It was just so easy on the ears, but still ripping. So... They went from that to the Young Brothers saying they wanted to go back to a more raw sound. The same year, freaking Pyromania was released and set the tone for 80s hard rock for the decade. So, I mean, the two were polar opposites. And if they just turned up the effects and the production, even a quarter of what they'd done, they may have maintained some sales figures. Now, I don't care about sales figures. Obviously, I'm like... But AC does. Oh, yes, they do. Coming off of 10 million or whatever Back in Black was at the time. I know it's astronomical now, nearly 30 million, whatever. That That's something. But when it is someone's livelihood and they depend on it, going from like 10 million to 500,000 is a big deal. So I know I may get crucified for this, saying such blasphemy regarding ACDC. But, you know, due to my passion for this, uh, I don't know. People have major passion for this band and I get it, as do I. But I'm not stating something that's factually not for everyone to hear. I mean, compare Deep in the Holes intro to like Shake a Leg's intro. And you're like, there's a significant difference sonically yeah. and it's polar opposite. So like as a side note, you know, just to 
keep up with my ACDC street cred here. Flying the Wall is my choice Brian era ACDC album, even beyond Back in Black. I love Back in Black, obviously. You can't not. But I love where they went with Flying the Wall. They ditched they ditched any sense of blues rock, which I'll also get crucified for because they're known for that. And I love it. But to me in 85 ACDC with flying the wall with the effects and the production and the songs in that album, like that's my like go to, if you want to get really killer and just put up your max bench, max squat, whatever you want to do, <laughs> that's the album you listen to. So yeah. anyway, that's my spiel on flick of the switch. So I, I just listed flick of the switch was one of my flops. Oh, and, oh, that's right. Yes, and 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 you know, strictly, and I, hey, I'm with you. Uh, I I worship ACDC, and, <laughs> and I I worship the Bon Scott era. I, I I worship every every part of them, and I've told people that Back in Black may be my my favorite album of all time, but yeah. uh, to get you know, like you said, the the to go from Mutt Lang Highway to Hell. Mutt Lang back in black, Mutt Lang for those about to rock. And then the drastic difference to flick of yeah. the switch, which yeah. still went platinum. But when oh, you're yeah. when you're ACDC at that point, platinum is other bands selling 50,000 records. You're like, totally. so so I and I and I do really like that album, but it, yeah. it's a drastic change, and you can see why uh you know they had to reverse course after yeah. click the switch to to get back to some semblance of normalcy yeah and then people they probably knew that and then people start to bag on the sound and effects of fly on the wall i mean brian brian has some effects on his voice but yeah. dude that album to me is like the oh, epitome. Yeah. it's like the epitome of hard rock <laughs> all right okay uh so i Man, so sometimes I, I worry that I talk about this band too much and and Metal Mike probably feels the same way, but I'm such a huge Lillian Axe fan. Love them. Their first four albums, which you know were a span from 88 to 93, are, are just phenomenal. You know, yeah. their debut album comes out in 1988. It's perfect timing. Robin Crosby from Rat produces it. Um, however... They were on, their record label was MCA, which most people know stands for Musician Cemetery of America. And right. that label, and I, that label just screwed this band from the word go. So yeah. I, I collect uh, music magazines. Um, oh, yeah. Like all the, sh all the shit that people probably see on my wall. Those are all just original music ads. And oh, cool. So yeah, so I actually, I actually have a little side business where I sell that kind of shit, you know, because oh, nice. you know people. So I love it, and, and people love it. But so I have like every Kerrang magazine, every Hit Parader, Circus, and all that, and you do not sh see shit about Lillian X in the late eighties, mm -hmm. and so. You don't see ads for their albums. You don't see articles on the band. So, so that's why I say MCA screwed them. But the big screw up and, and the mistake that I'm that I'm going to talk about is is the fact that on the debut album there is a ballad called "Nobody Knows," and in my opinion, uh, you could put that right next to "Poison's Every Rose Has Its Thorn," which most people would say is probably in the in the top five hair metal ballads of all time and mm -hmm. went to number one on the billboard charts i think nobody knows stands up and i love every rose by the way i think nobody knows stands up next to that song and and the band or you know the record company how that did not get a video and pushed to beat shit at radio and mtv is beyond me and the band never recovered you know yeah. they've had a great career they're still doing it but the follow-up love and war which is amazing doesn't mm -hmm. really sell true uh, uh poetic justice in 92 great album doesn't lead to superstardom psycho schizophrenia in 93 great album um but it started with that debut album and i think that nobody knows not being a single is one of the biggest mistakes in their career dude God, so much to say about Lillian. So I totally agree. Uh, Metal Mike and I did the 
top 15 ballads episodes one and two and he had this song as his number one and i was pumped because i always thought it was such a cool song a great song and i'm a lillian guy dude like that was early like i said i'm late to the party i'm i was a young man in the in the heyday so that Thanks was a, for always pointing out how young you are okay I'm 50 thank you very much hey i'm in my 40s dude i'm gonna be 43 in a couple of months this is crazy anyway <laughs> Um, but he, yeah, he had his number one. So I discovered this in like the early two thousands and I had to like scratch to find this album back then. Cause it was like out of print and all that stuff. So I finally found it and I was like, Jesus, like the first three are so killer to me. Cause that's all I had at the time, dude. Well played. I totally agree. They, they messed up by not releasing that one as a single, maybe second or third, <laughs> So yeah, that's what I got to say I, about. I uh, so I I also I did a a video on ten hair metal ballads that should have destroyed the charts. Yes, and and nobody knows was tied for number one with "Standing Alone" by Taiketo. So anyway, uh, two, two right. ballads we, that should we just did that uh, CMC like top seven CMC episode. And uh, I heard it. You did strength in numbers, didn't you? I did. And, and I've never been a big Taiketo guy. I, I, I have their stuff. And I was like, dude, I got to get back into these guys because I love Wasted. And yeah. I was like, why don't I love Taiketo? So I, I actually did kind of re-engage. And about your, your metal magazine thing, I'm actually sitting in my, my oldest daughter's bedroom doing this right <laughs> now because I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Yep. And my two-year-old is uh, napping my four-year-old is with my wife and i'm i'm in the the farthest wing of the home trying to stay away but point being my man cave was very similar to yours prior to having young children when i had to rip it all down and how to become a an adult which is bullshit right. Right. but i will say if you need any um supplements to your magazine collection this is also what kind of got me into all this because when i was a junior in high school I found about 150 um, Middle Edge Hit Parade or Circus magazines at the, the flea market or the swap meet in Santa Cruz. And I went, oh, let, let's look for the ACDC and Crocus ones. And then I went, what, what, what's it take for it all? And he said, 10 bucks for them all. No way. So I, I have a bunch. I have so many. So if you got any, if you got any holes in your collection, you let me know. Oh, and I'll play in. I'd spend a lot more than 10 bucks on that. But yeah, let's um, look that. No, that's awesome. That's These awesome. days, it was it's it's a lot more. Oh. I'm not hard, I'm, I'm not saying I would charge you. I'm just saying oh. if you need me, I got you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's awesome. Very good. All right, so let's go on. What are we at? Your number eight. Number eight. Yes. So number eight, I have Def Leppard releasing "Women" as their first single on Hysteria in the United States. So I shall start by with with the the inf infamous inflating quote by Phil Collin, and that is. We were in debt three million and had to sell something like three and a half million just to break even. Both those figures have inflated larger and larger over the years. Yeah. The, latest, <laughs> the latest I read was um, we were in debt five million, but whatever. So that number continues to grow and inflate just like any athlete or I'm a firefighter. So every story we have inflates over the years to like the bigger and better fire we, we go on. Yeah. And, and whatnot so this yep. goes right into that but anyway um this sets up their uh their management really with a, the brilliant idea to release women as the first single in the united states um the band wanted animal and why the hell wouldn't you you know so as i stated before acdc will be my forever and always but hysteria may be my desert island album it's just got a little bit of everything so you know if you know hysteria if you know you know hysteria is Got a little bit of it all. So it also happens to have my, in my opinion, the, the perfect example of melodic hard rock in that song is Animal. And, you know, if if you can have a favorite song at, at this point in my life, it might be it, even though I'm ACDC first. Def Leppard is number two. Animal to me is like, you just don't turn it off. It's just, it's got a little of everything. So, but I mean, are you kidding me? Like women over animal, I... I like the song Women, but I don't love the song Women. And the same goes for Rocket on that album. Yes. But um, Animal, as a first U.S. single, would have saved these guys 
years on their lives due to stress involved <laughs> with the initial flop, which was like a, you know, a triple platinum flop or whatever. But, you know, they had, they would have had an instant hit on their hands and save that stress. And then the miracle pour some sugar on me comes out and the album goes crazy. And next thing you know, you got back to back diamond albums. So it all worked out, but man, it would have saved a lot of stress in these guys' lives. <laughs> you, you, you know what? Like, and so I, yeah, I've talked a little bit about Def Leppard, but Women and Rocket. Yes. They're decent songs. But, of course. But the, that they were two, two singles. And, I, and I'm completely with you. I think Animal is, is maybe the best song on that album. I've always had a soft spot for Gods of War. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, wasn't a single. But, um, yeah, that's you know obviously the band goes on you know the thing sells like 12 13 million copies but there was some nervous months dude when that thing first came out and they were like holy shit we are gonna lose our asses yes i mean if you're gonna have i want to be your hero as a cutting room floor song because you had too many killer songs on hysteria like dude I've said it before, that's like any, not any, but a lot of other bands crown jewels. And then you got like, don't shoot shotgun, love and affection. Gods of war is just, yeah. dude, that's probably my, my very, if you know hysteria as well as I think, you know, it. the part post solo when they, and they do it live so well and Phil and Joe get in and they do the, wow, that part before yeah. the God of war, it's just like, yeah. Oh, dude, that's perfection. And I love seeing it live. Every time they do it live, I just go, ah, they still got it. And it's just yep. perfect. So and my it. favorite part is is at the end, and it's not, but when when Ronald Reagan's so I, <laughs> I, I was in the military for, for 22 years, but when he says they counted on America to be passive, they counted wrong. And then I'll say, <laughs> sure, I'll just I love that. I got goosebumps just talking about it. Yeah, not to get political, but you must be thrilled these days. <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> really hey by the way charlie wants to say hi charlie's pregnant aren't you oh. yeah so uh okay my number my number eight um it is so the mid 90s were such a hard time for so many bands uh i i just did an an episode with uh with jones who on on X is drummer boy Jones. Anyway, we talked about Janie Lane. He's a huge Warrant fan and and met Janie and hung out with him a few times. And we just shared some stories about Janie Lane and Warrant. Um, and we, you know, we talked a lot about those mid 90s albums, Ultraphobic, Belly to Belly, which were definitely more grunge influenced. Well, there is another band from from you know that late 80s hair metal era that I love. And the, the band is LA Guns. And, and I yeah. love the, the debut. I particularly love Cocked and Loaded. And then the love. next Holly, or Hollywood Vampires is also solid. And in fact, shit, the, the, the album after that, now I can't remember the name, um, Vicious Circle. Mm -hmm. But in, so October 29th and 96, they put out an album called American Hardcore. And yeah. the band name wasn't L.A. Guns. It was the L.A. Guns. <laughs> Changed it. So the singer is Chris Van Dahl. And I'm not a Pantera guy. That is way heavier than, than I can fucking take. Okay. Right. But American Hardcore. And I'll put, I'll put a picture of the album cover. It, it, it's a shit show. Okay. <laughs> and and it's, it is... It is LA Guns saying, fuck it, we're gonna try to do Pantera as well. Yeah. And um, you know, I don't always sometimes I'll but I'll I'll try to share a, a song titled, but anybody who knows this album knows that you got about 45 seconds in and you were like, What the fuck did you guys just do to your legacy? Yeah. Um, I saw this tour, they opened up for warrant on a couple club shows and I saw it in Minneapolis and they played, which, you know, give them credit for saying, Hey, you know, we're, we recorded this album. We're going to play it live. They yeah. played most of it live and the audience and Tracy guns was wearing fucking bib overalls and looked like he was on the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. And, and um, 
the only, they they played two songs that the crowd would have known rip and tear and sex action and wow. basically he let people in you know he would put the microphone out in, in the crowd and let people sing it but wow. it, was, it was a disaster by the end of that tour chris van Dahl was let go they they bring in i'm probably going to pronounce it wrong ralph sains or sains yeah. yeah. who is is now in in um steel panther in steel panther which i love steel panther yeah they bring him in to finish the tour. They they go. They put an out put out an album with him that is more of a return to form. But I think you might be covered. But bands that that just went in completely the wrong direction with their sound um, pissed me off. And oh, yeah. and L A Guns with American Hardcore is just a prime example. Oh, totally, dude. I got a little refresher on this recently again with the CMC release episode we did with the 80s glam metal cast. And dude, I was like, well, I love Ellie Guns. Let's give it another shot. And I was like, oh my God, what am I listening to? Dude, it is insultingly terrible. And I don't know what they were thinking. And anything straying from the first two, well, kind of three are like not going to be killer in my book. And this certainly certainly wasn't like it looked like a little like look at the album cover it's like yeah. a little like dude spray painting a wall Gangster like, oh. dude wearing yeah. a bandana uh yeah. you know it's like okay tupac uh but <laughs> um yeah it's yeah. i i and so i i have heard that cmc was they were pretty cool about saying hey you know we'd love for you to record an album like your classic sound but do what you want Oof. you know but I just wonder when when L.A. Guns said to CMC, "Here's American Hardcore, our new album. Check it out and and release it." I w- I wonder what the reaction was the first time because they had to know. Oh, like, they were so happy, I'm sure. Well, <laughs> but they had a contract that they couldn't back out of because. Of course. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's my number eight. What do you What do you got for number seven? Seven. Okay, so I got Gary Sharon doing Van Halen three. Yeah. So I mean, come on! It, it it discredits both of the incredibly talented camps, being Sharon and Van Halen. Again, huge Van Halen guy, and I dig Extreme. I but I I love Van Halen, both Roth and Sammy. Yep. So this was a song that debuted on uh, our local radio show or our lo- radio channel KSJO San Jose um, when I was a I think a junior in high school and the song without you came out. And at first with my innocent ears, I thought, well, this sounds like Sammy Hager to me. Like the, they, they didn't change singers. What's going on here. And it's not that bad of a song, you know, with my innocent ears, like I said. So like, why'd they change singers if it sounds so similar, but obviously now I realize they're vastly different, but um, the look, the video, the sound, none of it worked. Um, Van Halen was just so used to putting out number ones with Sammy and just tossing something out and it would just go number one. But what a black mark on their amazing history. And like, to me, the only tolerable moments are without you and fire in the hole, I think is okay. Um, Mitch Malloy was there for a minute. And, and if, you've, yeah, like, I, I mean, he probably would have been a little bit more palatable, but some of the demos have been released over the years and they sound pretty good, but like any other further change would have been disaster. I mean, like, Look at the divide that was created between the the Sammy and the Dave camps when that happened in '85. So, like, I'm definitely in the minority, like I said, of loving both Sammy and Dave. Usually, to me, it's just like mood dependent. You know, if you're feeling like throwing back a few margaritas and listening to OU812 and being like in the Mexico mood with Cabo Wabo, like, dude, all power, more power to you. But if you feel like being a little bit filthy, throw on dirty moves or something like that, and you'll be like <laughs> the Dave thing. So, anyway. Um, I crank both those versions religiously, but definitely not this one. And it, it's, it really makes me bummed out that that even was put out to the public. So I come from a, di- I, I come from probably the, the weirdest I, and I do, I, I really like Van Halen. I don't say that I love Van Halen and mm-hmm. here's where I probably lose a lot of people. I probably prefer Sammy solo. Oh, wow. Over van hagar or van halen huh yeah i love sammy solo for some reason yeah um 
I do too. I'm I'm a Sammy solo guy as well, but yep, I favor him with Van Halen, but yeah. I, I really enjoy Sammy's everything sure. he does. I the, the the Sharon album is one that I probably break out once a year and I'm like, all right. Cause I kind of like without you. Yeah. But I'm I'm like, I'm I'm gonna try and yeah. find something else that I can say, hey, it's not that fucking bad. It's that fucking no. bad. <laughs> bad. <laughs> Holy shit. And I too go back to albums like this is gonna sound weird, but like in the early 2000s, I went back to Nelson after being like, ugh. And I was like, oh, I love it. What the hell was I thinking? And when I first heard the Winger self-titled album, I think I heard Purple Haze first and I was like, nope, nope. And then of course it's like, you know, Winger is one of my favorite bands of all time. So like I try with my more mature years to go back to stuff and sometimes it clicks and I'm like, damn, I was missing this all along. But yep. this one, I'm right there with you. Like I do not go back to this album. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, I did like a couple songs on the first Nelson album, but don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, my number seven, and this is going to be closely related to the LA Guns one. Um, yes. I've said it before. I'll say it again. In 1989, I probably did not relate to any band more than Skid Row. I, I loved the debut album, and so did everybody else. It sells yes. 5 million copies. I loved sub or sub i loved slave to the grind um it so in in my flops episode i listed slave to the grind as a flop a lot a lot of people have a problem with that fucking categorization <laughs> um, but to go from five million to two million they released five videos and none of them were hits so i said it was a flop anyway yeah. Slave to the Grind is my favorite Skid Row album. Yeah. But then they come out in March 28th of 1995 with Subhuman Race. Mm -hmm. and, and I bought it the day it came out. And that's kind of, you know, like, like if there's a band that, that I love, I'm right there right away. Yeah. And I was like, what in the fuck did you guys do? Same thing with, with LA Guns. I probably can handle Subhuman Race a little bit more. But here's yeah. so I so I think subhuman race was a mistake. But I'll now I'm going to tell you how I think it got there because I saw the Slave to the Grind tour, mm -hmm. in and Pantera was the openers, and I had no clue who Pantera was at the time because Vulgar Display of Power was just getting ready to be released, and that was the album that they really blew up on. Yeah. So anyway, um. But Pantera opened the show. And I think, you know, and, and so there, that form of metal was gaining more traction. And I just wonder if Skid Row, you know, everything was changing anyway with grunge coming in. And I wonder if they saw, hey, you know what? Pantera in the 80s was a glam band. Yeah, exactly. You know, and they, they try to cover that up, but they were. They oh, were yeah. the shit. And and so and then they found new fame with this new heavy metal style. And maybe Skid Row said, you know what? What we were doing has fallen out of favor. So fuck it. We toured with Pantera. Let's do our best Pantera. And and it was a huge mistake. Right. Thought even though even though slave to the grind, you know was a relative flop compared to album number one i thought that was the right track to stay on you know uh it, for for album number three and you know you maybe can get a little bit heavier but the heaviness was so drastic on subhuman race that it, it just it, it lost me there's a couple songs i can hack on that album one of them is a ballad called breaking down um but uh, otherwise that's another album that I try to listen to every year and give it a shot. And I just, after every song, I'm like, why the fuck so heavy? Like yeah. heavy that it's not even, you know, it's it's heaviness without melody. So uh -huh. big mistake. Yeah, big mistake. Agreed. And I'll even take it a step further and talk about the, the can't stand the heartache version that I love of Skid Row. And to me, 
that was their wheelhouse. Even like piece of me and like, oh, yeah. I mean, it's all good shit, but like that was their groove to me. And that first album, you can't deny it. It's killer. It's an epic. I had a major skid row phase and I kind of did the same thing. And then I got subhuman race and I was like, oh, fuck, why did they do this to me? Like, I need more skid row because yeah. I love Slave. I love the self-titled more, yep. but it highly let me down. And dude, mega mistake. I listened to it recently again, like a couple of weeks ago, just randomly, just to see if I can get back into it. And I was like, man, there's a little bit there, but it's it's not catching me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and man, I love Skid Row. And, and obviously that is the beginning of the end for the band. You know, they oh. took Sebastian out in 96. And now they're, you know, they put out some albums and they, they put out some stuff that I like without yeah. Sebastian. Totally. But now they, they just lost another lead singer. Yeah. And, and you know, you're like, and, and I'm not one of those, hey, you got to get back together with Sebastian. Like, I understand there's sometimes wounds are too deep. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, if they are going to get back together with Sebastian, it's, it's now or never. And, totally. You know, and so the, the beginning of the end of the band goes back to subhuman race. Absolutely. Yeah, I think now's the time. And I really like their most recent album. I thought that yep. was really cool. I'm bummed yep. to see that guy gone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, apparently it's health problems, but yeah, you know, um, if, if you're going to do it, do it now. That's right. What's your number six? All right, cool. So this is Europe leaving the Hysteria Tour. And this yeah. was a major mistake by them. And I'll start off by just reading a quote. Um, during the summer, Europe, um, I'm sorry, during the summer, Europe did their second U.S. tour. This time, the special guests were Def Leppard. And now Ian Holland says, when we made the deal with Def Leppard, Hysteria, the album had started to drop in sales. So they wanted someone to help to, to join, to help them sell tickets and ask if they wanted to join. Just a week after we signed the deal, they got a hit with Pour Some Sugar on me. And everyone, including the devil, bought this album. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking back, I guess they did, didn't did need us, but we got maximum exposure and earned a little bit of money. So that's cool. Uh, the funniest thing, though, was that they asked us personally if we wanted to go with them on their indoor tour in the fall. But we were already booked for an Asian tour. So it meant breaking all those contracts. Plus, our management thought that the tour was more important. Lesson learned is that if you get a chance to tour with Def Leppard, you take them up. So the perfect example for this is Tesla. I mean, killer band. I love Tesla with a great debut album. Um, they got they got along famously with Def Leppard, and they still do. They, they regard Def Leppard as their big brothers and their good friends. Yep. And touring back then was like the equivalent of like 500,000 Instagram followers. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So like if you get on the Hysteria tour, that, that was humongous. So it was a huge way of reaching people. And I feel like um, Out of This World was a solid album with yep. really killer, a, a few really killer songs, Let the Good Times Rock and Just the Beginning, just to name a few, or like perfect melodic hard rock. But um, it stalled out compared to the final countdown. And this very well may be why, you know, they, they, oh, they could yeah. achieve multi-platinum status again. So I feel like this was a huge mistake by them, but it was probably a contractual thing. So it's yeah. not, it's out of their hands potentially. Right. And I mean, yes, contracts are contracts and I'm not one to say, Hey, go back on your word. Right. But the hysteria tour is one of the biggest tours of the decade. Yes. That album blows up. Yeah. So man, I mean, how many people saw that tour? How many people were writing about that tour? Uh, right. So, you know, I, I I covered out of this world as a flop because it final countdown went three times platinum. Out of this world goes platinum, and and it, it is a solid album. But mm -hmm. you know, I don't remember hearing about it nearly as much as the final countdown. But if you're on the Hysteria tour everybody's writing about that band you're going to get a lot of publicity so anyway completely agree but yeah i mean maybe they didn't have the option but right wow. exactly would have been awesome yeah all right okay so my 
so hey we're gonna stay on this this band topic because my next one is about Def Leppard and right. so hysteria August 3rd 1987 uh and we all know go 13 four, however many times platinum it goes diamond that's four years after pyromania yeah also went diamond so I did a video not too long ago with and it was the hair metal flops Brian from the hair band basement I'll pump his uh his ex account when I when I edit this but he said and I th I may have heard this before but he said that the band claimed they'd never make that mistake again of right. making their fans wait that long for an album it was 4 years between pyromania and hysteria and he said well they they kept their promise because they didn't wait 4 years they waited 5 years yeah <laughs> Uh, adrenalize yes Adrenalize comes out in march of 1992 now obviously steve steve clark passed away and obviously that's a huge part but right. he passed away in 1991 which is right. still four years after hysteria right. came out. so um so the album suffers immensely you know no i called it a flop it went triple platinum but compared to hysteria it's a flop and they released seven singles for Adrenalize. Now, you know that if the record company is, is promoting and making seven singles, all those videos, that costs a ton of money. They are yeah. thinking that this, you know, it it's obviously going to blow up. Now, tr again, Triple Platinum isn't bad, but it has to be considered a failure compared to what they'd but done before. So, again... I've said it before, if this thing comes out in 1990 where hair metal is still at, it's, it's you know, it's still up here in the record buying public, I'm sure this thing goes five to seven million. Totally. But when you when you are out in the age of Pearl Jam and Nirvana and your first single is, do you want to get rocked? Um, people were starting to go, you know what? That's, <laughs> we're a little bit beyond that. So- yeah. So 19, so the wait of five years, you know, it's probably still many people consider it a, a success, but that yeah. was a huge mistake. Well, look at their, look at their getup that they wore on the 1992 MTV awards yep. when they did, um, let's get rocked. Yeah. Dude, Joe is wearing a beret, the Beatles glasses, a trench coat, short shorts and black dark marketing boots like, <laughs> confused as shit dude like going from tear it down a couple years prior a few years prior when they were in their groove just riding high off hysteria being like dude we already have a new song out this is going to be a year from now we're going to release another one boom got this tragedy struck whatever but that get up kind of says it all. They were confused as shit. Now, I love Adrenalize. I still do, yeah. of course. Like, you know, personal property, stand up, kick love and emotion, all that stuff. Dude, I love it. And they had Tear Down on there, which is Joe hitting that like wheelhouse range, upper register where he just kind of live in. My favorite song on the album is Tear It Down. Great song, killer. So, but well played. Yeah, if it had to come out in 90 or 91 it probably would have at least been a couple million more maybe maybe one or two million more yeah yeah i i remember that the mtv awards and you, you had nirvana there all you know wearing their flannel and here's def leppard and the contrast yes between you're like oh that's where it was this is where <laughs> it's going and america decided okay we're we're gonna go with something new which yeah. I hated because I never got into grunge. No. You, you know, I mean, like there were new bands. I always love looking for new bands. I still do. Yeah. But I could not get Nirvana and Soundgarden. Those bands just left me cold. No, I've never done it. I never will. Yeah. All right. What's your number five? Five. Okay. I got Judas Priest declining the Top Gun soundtrack. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. And, uh, yeah. So, so this is an excerpt from, I think, Wikipedia, but it was kind of like the Europe thing. 
Judas Priest was also approached to allow their song Reckless in the film, but declined when the proposed contract stipulated that the filmmakers have exclusive rights to the song, which would have necessitated the band from omitting the song from Turbo. Uh, KK later called the option, the opting out a big mistake. The band offered their producers three other tracks and they all denied those. So this led to um, Priest doing the Johnny B. Good movie and covering that song, which I like. I actually do like it. Not, not a lot of people do, but it definitely wasn't a Top Gun hit. Um, yep. So also to me, like, wouldn't, wouldn't they have known that Reckless wasn't going to be that impactful in that album? Like, I don't know the legalities behind it. I, I don't claim to know the record business or what their thought yeah. process was sure. at the time, but they had, you know, Turbo, Private Property, Parental Guidance, Locked In. I mean, right. these singles were killer. And this happens to be my favorite Priest album, which again, I know, what's up? <laughs> Look at this. I You're love very it. Very famous. Okay. <laughs> I know. Um, this happens to be my favorite Priest album. And I know I'm, I'm in the minority here, but I love this album. It kind of fits into the rest of my tastes if you will um but who really cares who owns reckless or if it's on the album or not which i love the song but it wouldn't have impacted the album much if they had yeah. three others that they offered up to top gun folks whether they were other songs on the album or songs on the cutting room floor because i think turbo was supposed to be a double album and they said yeah -uh. so there was probably several songs left behind but anyway um they definitely would have had some more exposure with that Top Gun, but you know they had they had a good career anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, just, so I mentioned earlier that Charlie's pregnant. I just want to clear up any confusion. It's not mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the rec reckless. I I don't. You know when the band when the Charlie, please please sit down. Yeah, you're <laughs> very famous. Everybody likes you. When I don't think Reckless was, you know, when 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 a label puts out an album, they're they're like, okay, here are the potential singles. Yes. So, you know, Reckless was not a single. No. They must have known that. So, it was a that's oh, I mean that sound Top Gun soundtrack. That's one of the biggest movies of all time. Uh, now, I'll be honest, I fucking love their cover of Johnny Be Good. Yeah, it's great. one of my favorite. I'm I'm just, I'm shocked at the amount of people, the amount of hate that that song is given. You know, right. they completely made it their own. Yeah. You know, they, what? I mean, they they riffed it up. It freaking gets my blood pumping every time I hear it. Unfortunately, that movie, which I actually like that movie, but the movie <laughs> kind of flopped, so the single didn't do anything. But you are abs. I mean, obviously, Priest, you know, has had a epic career, but not. That Top Gun soundtrack could have been, is is a ton of publicity that they didn't get. So, man, you're right. That's a huge mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. My number five. So, if I had to list my five favorite hair metal bands, um, I know that Cinderella would would be in there. I mm -hmm. I love Cinderella. I think Night Songs. Night Songs is probably my favorite Cinderella album. You know, a, a lot of people bash on the look they had for the album, but that thing is all unbelievable album. And then they go on to Long Cold Winter, and I love Long Cold Winter, but there was starting to be some, I'm not a blues guy, okay? Right. Like the song Long Cold Winter is complete blues, and I hate that song, but there was a ton of great stuff on Long Cold Winter. But the mistake is in in ninety when they put out Heartbreak Station, uh, it was such a drastic change. Gone were the the you know the reverb drenched guitar riffs that you were just like, and it was acoustic. The first single, uh, Shelter Me, which which is a song that I like, but sounds really country at the beginning. There's there's horns in it uh, and i remember thinking hey i i kind of like this song but i also remember thinking what the fuck are you doing yeah and then you get the rest of the album and country influence a lot of blues shit and the 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 catchy 
guitar, you know, hard rock guitar riffs were just gone. There was like maybe maybe the more things change is yeah. the one that was kind of reminiscent of what they were done of what they'd done before, but not much else. And I get hey, I've had a lot of people who have said, well, that's they were just being true to themselves on and I get that. Hey, bands, bands can grow and bands can change. But hey, that that doesn't mean that that I'm going to change with them. And yeah. while I bought that album and and bought the next one still climbing, which which was a, more of a return to form on that album, uh, I that Heartbreak Station is my least favorite Cinderella album, and it's it it came out at a time. Poison went triple platinum that year, nineteen ninety. Yeah. Warrant yeah. and Slaughter went double platinum. Heartbreak only went platinum. And if they had, you know, again, hey, you can put some elements of that stuff, but if they had kept a lot of the the true sound that that fans had grown to love, they could have been they could have been what Poison is now. Poison is still a huge touring band because they had three multi platinum albums in a row, and if yeah. Heartbreak Station hadn't you know deserted a lot of fans i think they would be right up there with poison now totally. so, big mistake yeah. i can't stand it that album to me i can't stand it and i went back like i do to see yep. if i liked it yep. i'll tell you this i'll go back to native tongue all day over this one and be like it's pretty good you know metal mike loves native tongue i'm still working on it this album Dude, full on insult to the true fans. And you could see the progression. Night Songs is hands down my favorite. And then I choose songs off of Long Cold Winter. Like, if you don't like it, dude, killer song. Yeah. Of course, Gypsy Road, all that shit. Mm -hmm. But you could see it coming with them. Yep. Long gone are the days of Push Push, which happens to be probably my favorite Cinderella song on that right. Night Song album. And then, but the only thing is, you know they still had it in them because then they come out with the Wayne's World deal and they come out with my ultimate Cinderella song, Hot and Bothered, Bothered. after this shit. And I'm like, dude, you still have it in you. Yep. You know, why, why can't you do a Hot and Bothered similar album? Because that's the shit. I love that song. Yep. This album, dude, lost me. I bought it, of course, and just said, what am I listening to? Yep. But it's like, then you start to think like, was it in there the whole time and you were just like sure. like fooling with me the whole time and being like, uh, I'm going to do this metal thing because I know it sells right now in 86, right. 88. Right. By 90, I'm going to do this. But like to your point with Poison, like look at like Let It Play. Like Poison was starting to do the harmonica and yeah. the Let It Play stuff a little bit. And you're like, Ugh. like it's yeah. good. It still works okay for them. But you could tell it's like easy, guys. Like right. don't get too much further. And I know you're talking about horns in a prior episode, dude. Oh, horns and metal. Oh, absolute no, no, absolute no, no. It almost kills Easy Come, Easy Go, Winger, and it certainly yeah. kills some Lynch Mob album number two songs. So, yep. anyway, yeah. so like, like Poison, yes, they had like Good Love, fucking yeah. that song. <laughs> they, they they had they had elements, but they always had enough of that original hard rock sound on, you know, open up and say on ah, flesh and yeah. blood. And I love those albums, but you know, there was always a couple songs where I'm like, Oh fuck, here we go. Yeah. But enough of, of the earlier style, whatever you want to call it, that fans like us, were going to go, Hey man, there is some awesome. There's a couple clinkers in there, but heartbreak was yeah. getting to where, there was very little of the good stuff and a lot more of the clinkers. I, I did like Heartbreak Station. I thought it was a, was a really good ballad. But man, there are so many songs where I'm like, oh, skip, yeah. skip. Absolutely. So, totally. Yeah. Anyway, so still a huge Cinderella fan, but man, yeah. and, and, and still climbing is a very good album, but yeah. came out in 94. And when you when you basically bailed on everybody with Heartbreak, uh, still climbing had no shot so nothing yep all right man you're number four all right here's where i got the docking breakup and uh you know what i'd give for an 89 or 90 docking album i mean 
the slick new sounds we would have gotten from those guys in the early 90s, late 80s would have been so killer. Would have been a sweet combination of Up From The Ashes and Lynch Bob, and it would have been epic. I just know it. I mean, they were on the brink. They were, it's so odd that they were, they were an opening act all those years. I mean, to me, they're up there in the same mainstream classics in the same conversation as Motley and Warren to me, like Doc and Motley Warren. It's like, dude, they almost kind of are on the even playing field there. But they would have fit the look, the sound, the times, and caught the tail end of the, of the arena headline era and just just captured that 89 or 90. Like, look look what Motley Poison did in 89 and 90. It was amazing. So I guarantee it would have been an epic follow-up to Back for the Attack, which is my favorite. Yep. And they would have had some amazing shit on there. Um, I think the Monsters of Rock Tour probably did them in. Yep. And it seems that it all went wrong there. And they went their separate ways. And there was a drug issues and the rift that just like exponentially grew and that was probably what really did him in but man if i could just go back in time and have those guys hold on just a couple more years that would have been their headline status an yep. absolute ripper don would have had at least two of his ballads on there that he would have probably freshly written it would have been great so ah, what a bummer um i really like the don dawkin album up from the ashes yes uh but that thing flopped because yeah. it was Don Dokken and not Dokken. And I remember yeah. hearing an, an interview with, with Don where he said the same thing. If we had one more album, uh, he feels like they would have blown up. They would have become a headline act. But, yeah. you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, And, yeah, you, you, I mean, shit. You, you hear so much about, about Lynch and Dokken. And man, I'm su- I'm surprised even to this day they still try to get together, and it's like yeah, try it again for the payday, and then it you know, <laughs> backfires. But anyway, yeah. yeah, what what a band, and you know it's it's unfortunate because they were almost there, so close, almost. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, my number four, I when when hair metal ended, I think that a lot of the blame was placed on bands like Danger Danger. Danger Danger Trickster. They started being like the way more pop side of, of metal. The, the, you know, the, the, the hair metal bands that were, you know, not geared towards rough and sleaze, but geared towards, hey, let's get girls and, you know, we'll be the... Pr-. So anyway, but I really like Danger Danger. And- oh, yeah. And I thought their their first album, I thought both their first two albums were were great. But Danger the Danger Danger debut comes out in June of 89. 89 is maybe the biggest year in hair metal. You know, right around there. You got the skid Dr. Feelgood, Skid Row debut, Warrant debut, all sorts of, of stuff going on. Yeah. They have two minor hits in Bang Bang and Naughty Naughty. Totally. And my shit, my son loves Bang Bang. Um mm-hmm. But they never released a ballad. And at this time, you had to have a ballad. Yeah. And, I, and, and here's where it gets ironic is the band wanted to release a ballad, make a video, release it as a single. The re- and usually it's the record label who's like, hey, we got to have a ballad. You know, and the band, you know, bands are like, hey, I want to focus on our heavier stuff. But here it was the opposite. The, 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 the record label said no you know let's let's hey let's go in and record the follow-up we'll do the ballad on the next one well screw it comes out in october of 91 it's a decent album there's a great ballad on there uh with shit what's it called uh I I still think about, about you yeah but, you, you know great ballad but it was it was over by then yeah the had, had come out it was over and there were two ballads, Don't Walk Away, and, and shit. So I graduated in 1991. My high school prom theme my senior year was a song from Danger Danger's debut album, One Step from Paradise. Nice. And either one of those, you know, could have been major hits. Now, that doesn't mean that they were going to go on to this great career. I mean, their second album was probably going to flop due to timing. But that first album did not go platinum. And it may not have even gone gold. I think it was close, but it could have gone platinum. It could have blown up if if the ballad was put out. So it was a huge mistake to pass it by. Yeah. 
yeah, odd. They seem like the perfect ballad band. And, you know, the, the two singles they did release were great. I love both songs. I love, I love Danger Danger. I talk about them probably too much. Um, and I love Screw It. And I love Cockroach. I love Cockroach. And Tangent, Afraid of Love is probably my favorite Danger Danger ballad. What album is that on? Cockroach. Okay, I got to go. I've listened to that, but I, I just don't remember. Ah, uh, dude, it's very much worth it. Worth the listen. Both singer versions, so it's, it's a really cool yeah. album. But couldn't agree more, dude. I, I I don't know why that didn't happen because they were the the pop metal thing, and a lot of people do blame you know the Danger Dangers and Tricksters of kind of like suffocating the genre. But to me, bring it on, dude. Like yeah. I want more and more and more. Yeah. I don't think it was their fault at all. I think they were no. just doing what they do. Yeah, you know, and, and I've always I've always said like like man, I was in college when in '91, and we all we all thought, oh, here's just a new type of metal, and we thought the grunge could coexist. I mean, we found out how fucking wrong we were, but <laughs> you know, I mean, yes, the more the merrier. Hey, let's get more music. You know, you don't need less. Let's have more. Yeah. So, all right, what's your number three? All right, number three is broad, but it's. 1992 and beyond okay so it's kind of all the stuff we've talked about but i'm just going to kind of group it all in and let me just start by naming off my top 10 of 92 from the 80s glam metal cast um top 10 we did i had def leopard as number 10 and that's saying a lot because of my love for def leopard but they were number 10 that's how strong 92 was for me yep. um heavy bones 21 guns Widowmaker, steelheart warrant my favorite warrant album Saints and Sinners, Wild Side, Unruly Child, Hardline, a band called Masquerade, XYZ, House of Lords, Shotgun Messiah. Like these were just a, I actually did about 13 albums there, but those are the, those are the albums that came out in 92. So this and my next are like the, I know bands have to mature and change to keep up their sanity, but like where's the line that they inevitably cross that alienate their true fans that made them famous and support their livelihood. So, so the bands I have on my 92 list are some of my favorites. 92 is hands down my, my ideal melodic hard rock year where shit yep. should have gone. So playing vast Monday morning quarterback, you know, 35 years later, lots of these bands broke up because they were booted off the label. Yep. So it's not their fault in essence or they outwardly changed their style to try to fit what's going on. And it really, really didn't work. In fact, it's got dudes like me refusing to even acknowledge some of their latter albums prior to the first three, you know, the wingers, the skid rows, the danger dangers. I don't, I know you don't agree about warrant. Like I don't go past dog eat dog Good. and Good. try. I don't. Yeah. And it's just one of those. So in, you know, like I said, in may, mega retrospect, they should have either broken up or completely gone in a different direction um, in their life, you know, yeah. sought out a new livelihood or whatnot, which is easy for me to say now, I understand. Yeah. But it, it was, 92 was definitely the, the direction that I think metal should have started going. It was crunchy. It was updated. You had that great combination of you know, like I said, crunch production, huge drums. There was shit coming out that was so smoking. And unfortunately, it, it missed the mark by this much. And Wild Side's a perfect example because they were put up in 5150 studios. They were young guns and then they were Wild Side. And here they are, like maybe going to be the next big thing. Thought they were big men on campus. Freaking killer album. And nothing, nothing happened. And yep. it sucks because it's so quality. And their second album is so insultingly yeah. different and terrible. I was appalled, just like Widowmaker. So yep. that's my 92 spiel. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I love 1992. In fact, well, I mean, not to keep promoting my old videos, but one of my most recent ones is, is called The Curse of 1992. The band go. got left behind exactly. after that year. And yeah. I, I worship wild sides under the influence album yeah. I, I thought it was the second coming of appetite for destruction and and i get so i love warren's ultraphobic but yes. but even when i first listened to it i was like what the fuck did yeah. you just do and and i i grew probably mainly because of the lyrics probably you know and i've explained 
you know, like, like my life was falling apart. I had a bad drinking problem. So I, I related to it because I saw a lot of myself in those lyrics, yeah. but yeah, a lot of those bands went in a, the wild side album, subhuman race went in a direction where you're like, no, what you were doing in 92 was just fine. And, yeah. and, and I thought the big, like I got sick of eighties lyrics about, Oh babe, I love you. Yeah. It got overdone. The yeah. lyrics were so much better in 92. You totally. know, the music was a little bit harder. Um, the lyrics were a lot, you know, more mature, you know, and, and I liked immature shit, but, yeah. but the change after that got too drastic and it, it fucked over a lot of those bands. Totally. All right. All right. My number three. And I think this name has been brought up before. But one of the biggest albums of the 80s, one of the biggest bands of the 80s in 1987, the self titled White Snake album comes out. Oh, yeah. And uh, man, here I go again, still of the night, still, I think, two, two of the most popular. Uh, man, I love those songs. I, I have gotten a little tired of Here I Go Again, but that's just because yeah. it's a monster hit. Yeah. It goes on to sell what, seven or eight million copies? Is one of those two. But they fucked up so bad. David fuck David Coverdale fucked up so bad when he fired John Sykes right after that album was recorded. Sykes wrote most of those songs yeah. with Coverdale. He is, in my opinion, responsible for a ton of that sound that they got on that album. And not only does he does Sykes get fired he gets fired before they even shoot the video before they sh before they do the tour you, yeah. you couldn't let him you couldn't let him do the tour and get all that attention that he deserved and then and then maybe you know get another guitar player for the new album if that's what you were wanting to do but right. why is it a mistake because in 89 they released slip of the tongue and Sykes is gone, and I'm a big believer in karma. So I'm not against Steve, Steve Vai and, and the guys who came on to play on the follow-up album. Yeah. That is one of the biggest drops to go from 8 million to 1 million on Slip of the right. Tongue. And and after that, I mean, White's, you know, White Stakes was still like a good touring band, but you never heard anything album-wise from White Snake. After that, you know, Coverdale went on to do some shit with uh, Jimmy Page, but yeah. I feel like the firing of Sykes was the mon monumental decision in White Snake's career and kind of led to their downfall. Listen to the intro to most of the White Snake songs on the that album, as well as the Blue Murder album. And they all, and I'm not a guitar player, but they start off with a down the fretboard, boom! Yeah. And they all, it's just like a motor starting, dude. Totally. And it's like, oh, Sykes was so killer. Like, yeah. What, what was wrong with the dude? He, he yeah. looked the part. He looked great. Yeah. He played great. He had a great pedigree. He wrote yeah. the freaking hit songs. Children of the Night is one of my favorite songs of, on, on the album and, and the next album. I love those two albums. Yeah. Why is it 87? Slip of the tongue. They're both killer. Sure. sure. Vastly different. Vastly different in the sound. Yep. And I totally attribute that to Sykes' demise yep. or, or exit. But um, I mean, hey, he came out with Blue Murder. I, I love that album. The next yep. album's okay too. But um, yeah, what a what a weird um I mean you see you see all the reports over the years, Coverdale claiming oh. Yeah, but I made him a millionaire. It's like, who gives a shit, dude? Like, that's killer and all, but you also, like, that was his baby. Yeah. And, you and he'd been in the band for, for a few albums by that point. And it'd be yeah. different if you could say, well, you know what? The guy had a drug problem or whatever it was. Yeah. I mean, maybe he just didn't like, I don't know. Yeah. Who but knows? you can't say that the decision didn't come back to bite him in the ass. And unfortunately... And I've grown, I used to not like the Blue Murder album. I've grown to love it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, shit, that thing should have been massive shit. as well. So, you know, the, the decision to fire Sykes didn't work out for Coverdale. 
and man, sadly, it didn't work out for Sykes either. So, no, you know, exactly. but that's one of the colossal fuck ups of 80s hair metal. <laughs> so, that's what you should have named this one the colossal fuck ups, not the mistakes. Maybe I'll put that <laughs> in the thumbnail colossal <laughs> fuck ups by these hair metal bands. Yeah. All right, man. What's your number two? Okay. So, I can't stand predictability. It's one of my worst fears of being that guy who's predictable. And I know this topic has been beat to death, but Motley is a passion of mine and they mean a ton to me. And they like made me realize like what it is to be like more of the badass side of life. So it's Motley 94 and Generation Swine. And I just gotta say, similar to my great offense taken by the bands that let me down in 92 and beyond, Motley Decade of Decadence is unbelievably killer with those three new songs. If they'd have just stuck, stuck it out and done the Rock and Roll Junkie, Angela, and Primal Scream, and oh, yeah. Punched in the Teeth by Love, which was on New Tattoo, but was supposed to be on a 92 Vince Neil Motley Crew album. And I know that because of the magazines we were talked about earlier. I read an article in one of the Motley magazines um, a metal-edged version of Motley Crue magazines in um, 92, and Nikki's talking about the upcoming songs that are going to be released on a 92 mm. album, and Punched in the Teeth by Love was one of them, which I love off New Tattoo. Right. So had they gone down that path, that would have probably been People's Choice Crew record, show, seeing that everybody loves Primal Scream so much, yeah. which I'm one of them. So, but instead they did what they just, they decided to do and they hired Karabi. Karabi. Obviously I listened to your show with Metal Mike and you guys discussed thoroughly that, and I completely agree that the scream is killer. I've always liked the scream. I bought that album and I thought it was, it was awesome. Yep. I've always, so I also think 94 is a very quality nineties hard rock album, undeniably, but it's not my hard rock. You know what I mean? So like it's, it's not Motley Crue, and I've learned to not I've learned to not bag on anyone's genre because they enjoy that genre. And, it, and who am I to bag on it? Because it, it to them it's great. But you know, so I'm not gonna bag on it because I like I said, I know it's quality hard rock, but it's just not my Motley Crue. Right. So then there's Generation Swine, and this is just like insultingly terrible to me. Like I just there's, there's there's no shining moments on that album to me. And as I said earlier about the fine line of insulting your fans versus and, and growing as an artist, this shit just went too far. I mean, I'll take new tattoo over 94 and generation swine every day. And I know that's a very unpopular choice by me, but I think new tattoo was where Motley probably should have, should have gone in a, in a more 92, 93 polished, primal screamy way than some of the stuff on new tattoo but that's my spiel and i totally know that there's there's some passionate people for 94 album especially but to me like i'm just such a vince guy and like i know metal mike is a huge vince guy but he loves motley 94 i just i can't i can't make the the transition into it right right what, what do you think of vince neal's exposed love it yeah. love it love it that's one of my favorites i mean yeah. dude fine fine wine like the intro the bass intro to that thing um sister of pain and of course i always talk about how i i kind of preach like at this point like oh i'm not like huge into the hits like the here i go agains and the cherry pies and whatnot yeah but you're invited but your friend can't come doesn't get old for me it just doesn't i love that song so i love that album i won't i won't i won't ask you to talk about carved in stone because that thing's a piece of shit <laughs> That falls in the category of 94. And, and yeah, that's right in the category of 94 and swine to me. <laughs> and, and I can, I can like, I like the 94, but, but that, that, that was a grower for yes. me. And when I first heard it, I did the same thing as I did with ultraphobic. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You really have to, you, you have to separate like, okay, this is not Dr. Feel Good, Vince, you have to go, okay, this is a completely yeah. new band almost, but I get it because yeah. I've done the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> completely agree. All right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. I, I was going to, I'm going to, the one that I had at number two is now going to be my number one. So my Hi. next, my number two is, is going to be um, it, it much later. It's going to start, it's going to be in 2003. 
So I remember vividly the morning of February 21st, 2003. I was sitting at in a breakfast at, at, at breakfast at a chow hall in Fort Carson, Colorado. I was two months away from driving through the heart of Iraq to a Ooh. base called Balad, which was 40 miles north of Baghdad. And I was going to be there for a year. Um, so I'd been in Fort Carson for about a month. We were allowed to drink at Fort Carson and I was an alcoholic, um, I, a, a functioning, you know, I didn't need to drink in the morning. I didn't, you know, drink all day, but I drank until I blacked out and I did that frequently. So I was in a really bad place. Um, but at the TV, at the, on the TV, at the chow hall where we were at, I remember looking at the, whatever it's called, the Chiron or something, the, the notes that come up at the, cause we had like CNN or Fox news or something on. Yeah. And, um, and it said uh, fire at a nightclub in oh. Rhode Island during show by heavy metal band, Great White. Right. And, you know, I immediately, cause I'm like, oh, that's a, you know, I love hair metal. I love Great White. I'm like, what the fuck happened? Well, in the years that, that have, that have gone by since then, I've really, I bought bought and read books on that i've watched every documentary possible because i loved the years where you know the bands probably didn't like him but i loved being able to see some of these bigger bands in smaller clubs and that club looked just like a place that i'd been at many times yeah. you know not yeah. that specific club but clubs just like that basically a glorified bar with a band yeah. stage you know 300 people there but you know for some reason, at at a club show that small, they they did some pyro. That thing starts spinning during song number one. If you've watched the video, which I've seen it a million times, yeah. all of a sudden you hear Jack Russell say, "Uh oh, that's not good," and boom, that thing went up in no time. And so anyway, hundred people end up dying. Uh, get, the guitarist you know it was it was great white but it was basically jack russell's great white even though mark kendall was in the band at that time it was right still. so uh but the other guitar player ty longley died um the the biggest nightclub fire in in american history and you know uh that that event i think set set in motion the downfall of jack russell He's, I mean, he'd already, he'd always kind of had problems, but if you've, if you've, he's got tons of health problems, tons of yeah. addiction problems. I have no, I mean, I can't imagine. I saw some horrible, sh you know, some shit in Iraq, but I, I couldn't imagine being the singer of the band that lit off Pyro and a hundred of your fans ended up dying and you're standing outside the club while people are breaking glass and screaming yeah. you're hearing that. So I, I can't imagine what it did to him. And, right. and, you know, I didn't want to turn this episode into some like set, but it just, I, I've just always been infatuated with it. And, and you can't deny that in the history of hair metal, this yeah. will be one of the things that is always talked about as, you know, as shit, why did that have to happen? Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of things. Um, yeah. Like I said, I'm a, fire captain for the city of Santa Cruz fire department. Right. Yes. And so this is a, a video that we have watched in training right. throughout the years. I've been with Santa Cruz fire department for 14 years. And prior to that, I was a volunteer and thank you for doing that. That's awesome. That's, that's really cool. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing what you've done. Yep. Um, so when I was a volunteer, it was a little more fresh, if you will, because this was like three years prior and this was like one of those videos we talked about and we observed and we watched. And it was like you saw people choosing not to become lifelong firefighters and make that career as volunteers because of this video. Right. You also had people stop going to club shows because of this. And I remember at the time, just like you said, I didn't get to see LA Guns open for ACDC. I got to see LA Guns at this place in San Francisco that held about 14 people, you know, and I mean, and, and that was cool for me because I got to go to CLA guns and like be as close as you and I are right now to them. Yep. yep. But on the flip side, the minute this happened, shit changed. And it was like, 
if you don't walk in and observe your exits and know where where you're going to get out if shit goes down and you're not going to be in the very front anymore either you're not on the floor in the front crammed into a potential stampede of people so this is a huge one and like yeah just like you said i don't mean to get bummed out by this but like it's a huge learning tool huge learning lesson and yep. it was a, an epic tragedy and, and 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 i don't you know i'm not saying that the the blame is on the band or jet i mean there's there's all sorts of theories from it was the club owners to it was the band manager to the band to whoever was the fire marshal who said that the club is fire code safe when so i'm not but just it's just so horrific and so i just you know yeah. if you're gonna bring it up because man i've just yeah. you know i've always wanted to to talk about it because yeah. you can't deny the the impact that it's had on the music that we love exactly yeah. all right Okay, you're uh, number one. Yes, so this brings me to Crocus Change of Address. Yep. So this is, uh, this album, this is a band that's probably, okay, so th this this was a band that uh, was probably, they were probably talked into making this album. You know, there, there's no way around it. The album pretty much sunk their career and killed the momentum. Uh, I became a massive Crocus guy in 1995 when I had tapped out on my ACDC albums available to me at the time. And my brother yeah. in laws you got to check out Crocus. Could be Bon Scott's brother. The singer yeah. could be Bon Scott's brother. And I said, okay, cool. I'll check it out. And I got the best of Stayed Awake All Night. And when Mark Starachi sang the first line of Headhunter, I just about died and went to ACDC Sound Like Heaven. So from there, I learned that, like, you know, what I normally do and go full obsession collection mode at that point. And um, at this point, like, I don't mind change of address, um, but what an incorrect move they made in 86. They had some major momentum with the Blitz. They played huge audiences. They had a decent, they had decent hits. And um, then we have change of address with almost like reggae riffs in various places, terrible production keyboard heavy and i don't mind keyboards when they're well placed but not in crocus and definitely not up front and the first two songs are kind of listenable but not anywhere close to where it should be uh, school's out is okay burning up the night is as kind of as close as it gets to a hard as, as hard rock as it gets but it's kind of like a b-rate hard rock thing um if they do done something more like heart attack that was that was the, the momentum continued to me. That album is like off the charts killer. And it kind of blends the hardship from like the, the harder stuff of like an updated headhunter in 88 with some catchy blitz material thrown in. But sadly, Change of Address totally killed it and it killed a lot of people being fans of Crocus. Um, to their credit, mid 80s actually looked pretty cool on Crocus. Not necessarily the burning up the night video look, but like the alive and screaming stage look and then the back album photo like they kind of embraced like the full 80s look okay they looked cool they had a really like hot looking drummer and all that stuff so that kind of helped but um yeah what a, what a massive downfall by these guys and I, i'm a big crooks guy and this this one really bumps me out <laughs> yeah i so i'm, I'm kind of like so kind of like you and that i'm all i i love hearing hey that band sounds like acdc i'm like shit yeah. all right like totally. I don't know if you're a Rhino Bucket fan, but yeah, Rhino Bucket to me that yeah. that reminds me of Bon Scott era ACDC. Oh. Anyway, that's probably what got me into because I'm a Crocus fan too, and so I just I loved the ACDC influence. I love those vocalists who have that yeah. that growl and that scratch in their vocals. So, um, I you know I I talked about the album Heart Attack before being, yes. you know, but. But I think you're right. You know, th their late later '80s stuff that was good. Well, it was hurt by that by that album. Yeah, when they were on a solid track, and you know, totally. my number one. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just a huge Warrant fan. Um, and and I've I've talked a a lot about Warrant, and I've done a couple of videos on Janie Lane. You know, uh, for for some reason, I got you know. Got lucky enough. I got pulled up on stage a couple times. I got to yeah. hang with four of us a couple times, and and so in the mid '90s, I really got my warrant groove on because their popularity had 
drastically lowered and they started playing club shows and like you said you know hey that's great for the fan you get to be right up by the band you get yeah. opportunities that you weren't going to get in a huge stadium so um i dog eat dog is my favorite warren album by the way yeah, me too. but i'm going back to cherry pie which is probably the most successful warrant album and the mistake that i think was Janie Lane actually writing the song Cherry Pie. Now, that writing the song obviously helped them become Im immensely popular, but I just wonder if it might have helped the band's longevity, might have helped their their uh their status in the music industry. They really became a symbol of what everybody said was wrong with music oh they're sexist look at the cherry pie video um <laughs> and 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 he's you know most everybody has seen the clip of him years later drunk saying i could shoot myself in the head for writing that song so story goes they they write the album the album is supposed to be well i've, I've heard that it, there was a time where it was going to be called Vertical Smiles. Oh. But, and and my my buddy uh, Jones talked about that in our last Janie Lane episode, and I've heard that title. Yeah. But I also heard that, and maybe that was just a working title, but when the album was finished, it was supposed to be called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Right. And the first single was going to be Uncle Tom's Cabin. Well, they give the, give the, the album to the record label, the president, or whoever listens to it and says, Hey, I don't hear the single. I I need something like Love in an Elevator. So Janie yeah. Lane in 10 minutes or whatever writes Cherry Pie and it becomes his legacy. It becomes right. his, you know, his cross to bear. The thing, you know, and I've I've said before, man, it I've probably seen Warrant 30 times and and in between every fucking song you hear people shouting, play cherry pie. And I got right. so sick of it. So anyway, um, I, I often wonder what it, what his life would have been like, what the band's career would have been like if he would have said, no, this is the album. Uncle Tom's Cabin is the single. And then if you need another rock single, there's Mr. Rainmaker, which I think is just a tremendous song. And yeah. then obviously had... I saw Red, Blind Faith, which became singles, are, are yeah. phenomenal ballads. So anyway, you know, Janie Lane dies when he's 47 years old in 2011. You know, horrible, uh, uh, just a, a horrible addict, dies yeah. alone in the hotel room. I And I, I don't think, you know, he was going to be an alcoholic. I mean, you watch all the, sh you know, he was drinking through shows constantly. But I think cherry pie just was one more log on the fire of his destruction and and it so i i wish for some reason that that song hadn't been written yeah and, and maybe their career well I'm, I'm sure it still would have you know maybe some things would have been different i you know who knows you know i've thought about this a lot too and i always thought because i totally agree with you what if we were just change the title of the song because it's kind of a hard song you know what i mean like it's kind of got balls to it oh, yeah. and if what if the what if the song title wasn't cherry pie like i'm not going to come up with something right now but what if it wasn't so that you know and, yeah. and it, it probably would have changed the momentum big time and oh. saved a lot of a lot of this what, what janie went through and yes dude uncle tom's cabin and mr rainmaker that would have carried those two would have carried the album in themselves like yes. the the mr rainmaker guitar solo and like i said i'm not a guitar player but like yeah towards the end of the guitar solo it's like oh dude like it doesn't get much more better than that yeah. and and much more better than that whatever um and then <laughs> much stronger than that and then there's uncle tom's cabin now i like cherry pie i yeah. think it's a cool song I've thought about this a lot. Like I said, man, just a different title would have been pretty killer. Yeah. Dude, 
I totally agree. I think um, uh, Dog Eat Dog was a killer direction. It's my favorite Warren album. And yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. Yeah. And, um, y- y- you know, may- what if Cherry Pie had even been on the album, but it the album was still called Uncle Tom's Cabin? Yeah, totally. what, if, what if Cherry Pie was the second single? Who knows? Yeah. What if the shit to death? But, totally. you know, I just... I was I saw Warrant play the, the day after Janie Lane died for they were playing oh, Grand Forks North Dakota the day after and I right. I just remember I couldn't listen to that song you know it was it was just yeah. so I just walked around the crowd and you know and I get like I loved it when it came out you know yeah. I was 18 19 years old I loved it but when you yeah. when you know the history of what happened to Janie Lane I just I feel so bad for the guy that he felt yeah. like that was his legacy when there was so much more than that. So totally. Yeah. Good. Number one. Yeah. Hey man, it has been awesome talking about yeah. your little mistakes with you. And I'm <laughs> glad we finally got a chance after chatting all this time to finally get together and do a, a video. So thank you for being on. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was very fun. Hey, uh, I hope, Hopefully, if you like this kind of stuff, I hope you give the video a like. I'd love it if you subscribe. I appreciate anybody who takes some time to watch, you know, what it is that I do. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you to all the people out here and that are that subscribe and watch what I do with the Hair Metal Guru channel. Until next week when we come out with a new video, take care.